So you survived Osric's gate. You've made it past the barrier and are evading the what were once men and perhaps the invincibles, only to dive deeper into the Ogdru Brotherhood's domain. Up ahead, you have a choice to make. You have a set of stairs leading deeper into the dungeon, and you can hear the sound of drums as the Ogdru Brotherhood's ritual commences and gets underway. But off to the left is a side hallway leading down into a quiet space. It's quiet down there and perhaps maybe a place to hide and get rest, but you never know exactly what's going to happen deep in the dungeon of the Doom Vault. So today we're talking about the Sleeping with the Dead encounter. Uh, this scene or this room is only available in ICRPG Core. It's not even touched on in the Mega Dungeon, so we're going to be sticking around with the Core version for now. Uh, additionally, this room is a bit of an optional room in my opinion. There is some opportunities to grant some treats, some loot, perhaps set some stuff up, especially if you're in a longer campaign. Uh, in a one-shot, it's less important to include, but you could uh, boost up your characters beforehand, um, especially there. Uh, but we'll get to that in just a, a second. So let's take a look at our map here and look at what we're working with. Like I said, this is a choice kind of to make. You can head further down into the dungeon or you take a side step off. And for me, if they do choose to take this quiet step, I would consider this a, a, a true you know, break. Um, if things are swarming them, I imagine it's kind of like that idea of them stepping off to the side. The enemies rush past or decide, hey, we're not going to go down there. Um, especially if this is the sleeping quarters of the Audrey Brotherhood, which it is. Let's uh, read the description. It says, The Brotherhood takes sleep near a large stone box or sarcophagus, which holds the corpse of their leader, Osric the Cursed. As they sleep, they slowly feed him life force to one day awaken. Living quarters for the Brotherhood. It's a very flexible room for GM discretion, make it rest or battle, and contains a codex on a small table. So that's what we're working with. And if these are the kind of details that I feel like if you do need that break, um, you have Osric the Curse down there, the leaders. It's the living room, the living quarters of the Brotherhood. So if the What Were Once Men or the Invincibles are still coming, you could treat this as like, we don't go down there. Like this is like, don't, this is uh, off limits to those monsters. And so you can take a small break from them and the What Were Once Men will return to the lake. The Invincibles will kind of wander around a little bit. They'll still be nearby because we want to bring them back for a time pressure later on. But for now, while they are in this space, like let's set those threats aside. As well as we were talking about some of the things that they're dealing with, we've got a bit of a codex uh, or something here at the back on a pedestal. We've got a sarcophagus, which we could use the map here, or if we're building with index cards, we could drop in a simple sarcophagus tomb here. As well as we have some sleeping uh, Ogdru Brotherhood uh, cult members. And I like to include a few that are sleeping because again, they are doing the good work of feeding their life energy into the uh, Osric the Curse, their, their leader. And so regardless of what ritual is already going on, there's always someone kind of on duty feeding life energy to this leader. When it comes to target, I would leave this probably at a 10 as well. If you wanted the feeling of dread to kind of emanate a little bit more, you could up this to a 12, but because this is a relatively safe space, dropping it down to 10 is always a, a nice indicator of a reprieve, um, a simpler room um, with less, less danger. For timers, at this point, there's a couple options with timers. The most easiest one to incorporate is just a D4 for when one of the Audrey Brotherhood might wake up. So we'll say, you know, three rounds if we roll a D4, three rounds. If there's if your players are especially flighty, what you could end up doing is do three minus or a D4 minus one, and then you would you could even minus one for any failed investigation rolls or you know failed checks because they're making noise um, as they're going along. I don't think there's going to be a ton of checks in here because they're safe. But if you wanted to include a few, you could en end up minusing something from the uh, timer anytime they fail. The other option for a timer is because we've now really entered into the bro the Ogdru Brotherhood space, um, the barrier kind of is that delineating line um, between their domain and more of the natural cavern of the Doom Vault. You could incorporate a world timer. And I I always liked it if they're um, feeling if they're not feeling pressured enough. I don't know why they wouldn't be, especially with the Invincibles. But if they if you really want to emphasize 
the need to get down to the ritual space, uh, you could drop in a world timer of say like eight or 10, depending on your feel for the table and say in this many rounds, the ritual will begin. It's not that in the end of this, uh, the ritual will be over and the game will be done. It's the ritual will begin and then we'll we'll see where they're at at this point. And it could kind of spur spur them forward while we take a break from the Invincibles for a second. So keep that in mind if you do want that world timer. Uh, it's uh, really beneficial. But for now, let's stick with just waking up the um, the one of the cultists. The other thing that we I like to include is the, the you know, when it comes to the threat is like we said the main key wondrous point of this scene is that there's this um this catacomb this sarcophagus here that's uh just feeding you're getting fed energy by these um by these cultists and so what i end up doing is i like to just kind of say hey you you see these these cultists here and you see these tendrils of energy they're thin or you know, sickly, and they're being drawn into the the cult, the this sarcophagus here, and you're not quite sure, but you just feel this terrible pressure going on. Um, you can tell that they're connected. Um, so there's that threat there that is more of a something really bad is going on in this, and it and it should be. Osric the Cursed um, is mentioned here. There's not a lot of detail about him, but he is the leader of the Brotherhood, and so he's asleep. Um, for a minute and so there should be some threat there that players can pick up on um, do we address it do we leave it alone what is that going to play into it's in a one shot less of a concern um, but if you're doing a longer campaign uh, it may play into a big baddie later on it could um, can make some connections there some some consequences of actions if they do leave them alone um, but yeah that's kind of the big threat and then the treat is we have down here this codex right here, but as well as you, if we recall the mechanics uh, room page, um, there's a portion of it, and I'll switch to it just real quick, that talks about loot when it comes to this Doom Vault. And it says that the Ogdru monks hoard their victims' belongings, be especially generous with shabby loot table um, in these spaces, and mix in cursed and epic rolls to keep players drooling. Even if you're running a one-shot, consider placing an epic loot chest or two to keep players seeking a few seconds respite now and then. So in this particular scene, you really can treat your players. Um, Throughout the whole thing, if you want to be dropping shabby loot, like it's a lot of fun to be dropping that, mixing in those cursed and those epics. And in this place, you could include uh, an epic chest somewhere um, that they would have to work for. I would probably make it, you know, a one heart, two heart chest if you want to have a bit of a time pressure so that they don't just kind of run up, get some loot, and, and do whatever. Um, this could give also give them a reason to stick around and explore. How long do we stay and try to pick this lock? Um, what's going to happen if we fail or we make too much noise? It might wake up the, the Ogdru uh, cultists. And so I like having that timer, the timer running against the threat, but the effort running against the really uh, big chest. And you can tell them that it's, it is going to be epic. But one thing that I do want to point out, and this is going to be on the, the cursed stuff. This is something that I've seen a lot. Um, I, I think the cursed loot table is underutilized. I know there are fans out there that really like it. A lot of people don't, they, they stem for it, or they wonder when would I ever include a cursed loot. And from my experience, as you read the cursed loot, um, so there are still some big boons to be had. Some of them are, are bad things. Like for example, the Ring of Tears, it gives you minus one wisdom. To remove a ring, a willing recipient must be found. So you kind of have to pawn that off to somebody. Like that could be bad. Helm of Toads, it gives you plus two armor, but it's negative three to your charisma. It's hard strength to remove. Croak after speaking, and you can speak to toads. So give and take there. There's even one that is a Cthulhu spine trap, a black spine of chitin strike, sticks through your hand for 1d6 damage. Like That's the loot item. So you could open this chest, pop, pop, done. When it comes to cursed loot, what I would say is that... If your players are curious why you've included cursed loot, or if you're hesitant to include cursed loot, like keep in mind that the cursed loot is there for players to latch onto and to play with. 
Um, it's not always about giving getting the biggest bonus or the biggest mechanical advantage. Like the curse loot is rife with role playing and storytelling opportunities. Um, the epic loot as well can really highlight into you know some really key items. But curse loot can make a character story. It can incorporate in a way that maybe you never would have expected and can make a turn for a character that is just fun and interesting to play out. So I wouldn't include curse loot all the time and if you do just let players know that this is curse loot. Don't punish them. Don't make them lose trust in you as a GM um, by hiding the fact that it's curse. Like give them curse loot. Tell them what's going on. Encourage them to play with it and have fun with it. Um, and if there ever is a real big concern that players are having issues with, that's a social conversation to be had, not something that you have to use the system to kind of address. Just work with it. Take advantage of what these are. I have seen it time and time again where a cursed loot item can develop into something really, really interesting that wouldn't have happened otherwise. So keep that in mind. If, I, if it were me, what I would include in here is I would include some shabby loot that's just lying around let you know one or two things that people can grab in the chest i would include something that's epic i would include something that's cursed in the chest so that you, you know two things are over there and then you have the codex at the back room that's another big item that's just there they have to kind of get over there to the thing as well as you could change the codex from a codex into an amulet for the upcoming guardians room and so you can grant your player something that's going to help them later on I firmly believe that if you do know that there's something exceptionally deadly, which the Guardian Room we'll talk about next is, then one of the best things you can do is rather than nerfing the room, is boost your players in advance. Give them something that's potentially going to help them out in advance, um, or at least offer it, so that if they do find it, they can take advantage of it. And that's what I feel like this item could be, is a way for you to look at what you have planned in the next room or the next couple rooms and give them something that's going to help them. It's not going to just be the key that goes, oh, solve the problem, all good and done. You still want to have the next room be relevant, but this way it can kind of ease or um, reduce that sting of some of the more deadly stuff that's going to be happening um, later on in the Doom Ball. So that's for treats. Now let's talk about kind of how this scene could potentially play out and we'll talk about a little bit of Osric the Cursed. Um, and so what I've normally seen in this room is that players see this tendril mass of magical energy and life force going through them. And I've seen too often that players just like sneak up to the, the cultist and just like, just gonna kill him in his sleep. It's like. Okay, like we're getting close to murder hobo territory, but understandable. You want to cut the ties between this thing and whatever bad stuff is happening in, in this uh, sarcophagus. I'll allow it. If it was me as well as if you got a successful hit on this, I would just finish the cultists outright. I wouldn't have them have their normal, you know, heart of, of effort. It would just be like, you're dead, as well as the tendril would potentially you know break as they they lose connection with the cultists um and they would do that potentially for both of them as well as you know you're kind of moved in uh if you if they don't take care of the cultists as they move nearer to the uh, sarcophagus perhaps what i would do is make it very clear that this this treat on the far side of the sarcophagus is a really good thing you can tell that this is like a key item for the Audru, but I would make it kind of at a cost. It wouldn't be just like, we're just gonna sneak over there and grab it. Um, you could, but what I would end up doing is potentially have where the, the sarcophagus starts pulling energy from the players. And so as they move in, the players start getting their life force drained just a little bit. It would be like, as you move past it, you feel that your energy is kind of being sucked into this, this sarcophagus. It's um, it's almost voraciously hungry for life force, and it pulls a, a hit point away from you. Um, for every round that you're that you're there, um, then you are kind of being um, pulled away. And it's only when you're really close to the sarcophagus. Anyone else in the room, I wouldn't really worry about. Oh, if you do do that, make sure that they you follow the move action economy because players will move 
they'll want to they'll they'll players once they find that out they'll most likely want to dash in like, can i just dash in grab the book and then dash back it's like yes you could do that but you can't grab the book whatever like play around with that don't be so much you know don't try not to be a stickler about it in, in a certain way but like if you are going to include some kind of trap mechanic in there make it a part of it like address it like players need to work through that solution maybe they can find some way that they can get it without doing it and just make sure that they know that it is worth it and don't make it so bad that it's not worth it at all because you are trying to give a benefit to your player and if anything you can use it to like tie into this connection maybe give them a vision of who this Osric, Osric the Cursed is but eventually they're going to grab that or they're going to kill off the uh, the other cultists so they can eliminate the timer and call it a day now Osric the Cursed this is a this is a moment where you can decide either to leave this as an unspoken like open-ended thread that may or may not come back into play later on if you are doing a continuation or if you're one shot you could drop this in for a quick moment um, so it's up to you if you just want this you don't have to answer everything you can just leave this as a dreadful moment but if you do want to potentially include Osric the Cursed this is what I would end up doing Osric the Cursed is this creature um, this leader of the Brotherhood and what I would end up doing is if they open the chest or after the cultists are dead and they've like had a brief moment of life force kind of feed into him and now the, the supply is cut off the sarcophagus opens slightly players peer in and what i would end up doing is i would end up having the osric be a child of azatoth this is a monster in the um in the you know in core and in master edition but this is a monster and the child of azatoth i feel is the best fit for what's available in core as to what osric the curse could be obviously you can make him whatever you want you can make him a vampire you can make him a werewolf you could make him a tentacled mass like the uh, lord arden in the beneath the door scenario or the children there but i really like connecting child of azatoth to osric the cursed here uh, because azatoth is another og drew so I was actually reading through the Doom Vault Mega Dungeon, and there's a little tidbit. If you don't know this about the Ogdru, the Ogdru is not necessarily a, a, a specific thing. Sometimes it's treated as a specific thing, and it, and it could be. But the Ogdru um, and Azatoth are Lovecraftian-type connections from ICRPG. Um, and so Azatoth is an Ogdru. Um, it's kind of there. So... The, if you're looking at, it's uh, in the Mega Dungeon, there's a little snippet that says the Ogdru is no monster in the conventional sense. Unlike a giant purple worm or other titan, this creature cannot be escaped by harming its innards. This thing is an undead god from a distant star. It devours souls, minds, entire timelines. If heroes directly encounter it, they're drew mad and uh, sor uh, sorcelled or even consider self-harm in its hideous presence. So in the Doom Vault, it's talking about the Ogdru as a specific thing. But as you pick up on other details throughout all of the Runehammer books, um, a nice RPG books, so the Ogdru can be almost these extra outer dimensional creatures like Cthulhu, um, Cthulhu, all those type of things. It's it's an eldritch being, and Azatoth is one of those specifically. And so I like to tie that in here. Now, if we look at Childs of Azatoth, it has a plus three. I mean, it has three hearts, has plus eight to all of its rolls, so it's intense. And it takes one action per victim within far distance. So in this case, it would have four actions um, because of all the players. It has the int spell confusion. All intelligent creatures are within far range, make all hard roll. Uh, all intelligent creatures within far range make all rolls as hard. Spell eater with a check, the thing can utilize any intelligent spell used by its opponent. It has an aura of decay for each turn spent within near range of the child of Azatoth. Creatures must make an intelligence check. Failure costs one stat point chosen at random. You've also got an telekinesis spell. Can move objects, even huge ones, with an intelligence check. Such objects are its only physical weapons. Um, it's int spell be uh, beckon. With a competing int roll against its victim, the child of Azatoth compels a target to walk slowly towards it for 1d4 rounds. The check may attempt it again each of those turns to break free. It's a memory eater spell. The spell targets a single victim and robs one of its key memories from their recent or distant past, whichever is more sadistic, 
an aura of offerings. Any creature within close range must make a charisma check. If they fail, they must offer one piece of loot to the dead god as tribute. Um, and you've got some other details which give some more background for this, but mechanically you you have that. Uh, and then I really like having this here because suddenly you can turn this uh, sarcophagus not into an actual sarcophagus with a you know a mummified body or whatever but it's like this statue that's just set in stone and the Audrey Brotherhood are treating them as their leader even though it's never gonna really wake up it's only ever it's not gonna move it's it's essentially a statue of some way um, but it's there influencing things. It's it's corrupting their minds. And if they're in this room, they can have this really brief encounter with the uh, with Osric, um, this child of Azatoth, uh, and then they can they can escape. And this guy is is brutal. These child of Azatoth are intense. So you can quickly have uh, a little bit of a intense moment as you face this creature. Um, it may do some damage. May make some def you know. Uh, damage to the players but eventually they're going to escape and then they have to just live with the fact that they now know how evil this thing is that there's this thing living under Nordberg that could ha you know really influence a lot of stuff um, sway the minds of people and you can play with that into future sessions and set yourself up for some stuff later on in the campaign or if it's a one shot you just include this as a, a moment of dread you kind of wonder what could be what would happen what would we have to do um, if this were to continue, um, but other than that, you eventually move on out of this room, realizing that time is of the essence, and we have to finish the Doom Vault mission to save the three kings of Nordberg. And that's sleeping with the dead. It's a fairly simple uh, encounter. It's it's a fairly straightforward. It's a nice reprieve. It can give players a moment to get some loot to boost them up. It can give you give you some story elements to include for future um, mining and seeds for later on. Uh, it can really dive a little bit deeper into the lore of the Ogdru and what they are. But what do you think? Have you run through the sleeping with the dead? What has normally happened with your scenes there? Um, we're getting really close to this, so we'll be looking forward to definitely catch up on the other uh, the uh, other deep dives um, here and share uh, with your friends if you know that you're playing any Doom Vault later on. But for now, let's head back to the kiln, keep working on it, and we'll catch you guys next time.